Okay. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Machine Learning Society Annual Conference. I'm Aarti Malhotra, and I'm glad to be the moderator for this session. It's a pleasure to introduce Ms. Bernice Herman. Uh, Ms. Bernice is a data scientist at Y Labs, the AI observability company, and a research scientist at the University of Washington. At Y Labs, she is building model and data monitoring solutions using approximate statistics techniques. Earlier in her career, she built ML-driven solutions for inventory planning at Amazon and conducted quantitative research at Morgan Stanley. Her academic research focuses on evaluation metrics and interpretable ML. She has published work in top machine learning conferences and workshop. She's also a PhD student at the University of Washington. May I now request Ms. Bernice to present insights about logging machine learning data if anyone has any questions, please feel free to post in the chat. We will have a Q&A session after the talk. Over to you, Ms. Bernice. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm so excited to present uh, here at uh, this conference. Uh, I'm just really excited to talk about logging uh, machine learning data and talk about statistical profiling. I think it's a really cool technique. Um, that we developed here at Y Labs, where I am a data scientist. So I'll present to you today our open source project, Y Logs, that fills a, a huge gap in the current data pipeline uh, systems and um, is of particular importance to machine learning, I believe. All right, so um, thank you so much for the intro. Um, I, I wanted to add this slide a bit just to tell you how my prior experience kind of all converged to this product and, uh, and the solutions that we're working on at Y Labs. So I am uh, currently a data scientist at Y Labs, where we build tools uh, for AI observability, monitoring, evaluation. Um, and in that work, uh, we have worked with a number of other companies and other enterprises who are trying to figure out how to do machine learning at production scale um, in a way that is robust and understandable and observable. Um, I also maintain a role at the University of Washington, um, where a large part of that focus uh, for the eScience Institute there is collaborative data science research and uh, supporting methods and open source software that kind of drives data innovation across um, academic disciplines. My own personal research is very much related to what we do at Y Labs. Um, it's about machine learning evaluation metrics, machine learning interpretability, and robustness to real world situations. Um, and one thing that's really exciting as an academic is the potential to um, use data logging that we'll talk about in a bit to provide data um, and insights about how real world systems work and where errors in real world, world systems occur. Um, and that could feed a lot of robustness um, and even rigorous kind of research on robustness because we know what you need to be robust to in real world systems. And finally, earlier experiences I had at Amazon as a software developer uh, gave me lots of experience with a massive scale um, machine learning product uh, where I learned firsthand the struggles of maintaining a, a real time system with millions of predictions um, per day and uh, well before the ML ops community got its name. All right, so let's talk a bit about um, what I'm interested in and how this feeds into what we're doing at Y Labs. So um, I'm personally interested uh, very much in establishing best practices um, within machine learning and within kind of the deployment of machine learning systems. And I'm also very interested in how data science and machine learning kind of converges um, and diverges with kind of production or deployed systems and research and the way we research and teach machine learning. So one place that the two diverge lately um, that I see is kind of training on data sets that are dynamic. So when you learn machine learning, you're often using a static data set um, and even very popular 
large data sets like ImageNet um, is static. It's one data set. It's always there uh, in that form. You may split it in certain ways to test, um, but normally that split is actually even done for you for ImageNet. This is very different from how you do machine learning in an enterprise uh, situation. In those sorts of cases, you may have data that updates every hour, every minute, more, more often than that, at least every day. And so dealing with those kind of problems um, is different um, and, and something that really motivates me to kind of work on tools and MLOps tools to improve the experience of, of those working in the enterprise. All right. And so another thing I want to acknowledge is the impact that machine learning and data science systems have on society. I uh, think a lot and, and, and speak and publish kind of in the spaces of fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning um, as it relates to my research and interpretability in other places. Um, and these, these issues are incredibly important to society. Um, and look, there are applications, um, things like criminal justice and other things where uh, our current kind of machine learning approaches using existing data sets that, that have biases and are fundamentally flawed um, really have a lot to go before we can like call those successful machine learning places. Um, but I do also believe very much that there are problems that are a little more redeemable um, in the kind of social data uh, with machine learning, so anything involving humans. Um, but what we do need are things like better evaluation, better data quality tools, and better observability practices. So um, the potential to have an impact kind of in some of these really large um, areas um, related to fairness and machine learning is really exciting to me. All right, so now let's get into the meat of things. How do, um, how do we improve those machine learning systems that I was just talking about that, that may have some redeemable qualities to them? Um, and this is a hard task. Uh, one thing you might consider to do is uh, start where you start with a lot of other software sy systems, traditional software um, before machine learning. And that is when you find an issue or an error, debugging the system for with that issue in mind. Okay, well, if you're experienced uh, with dealing with a production machine learning model, uh, you probably have spent some time debugging or trying to debug unsuccessfully um, a machine learning system that has run into an error or multiple errors. And the way you might approach this is um, checking the code, checking the model version. Uh, so if you have some, some metadata about the model um, and, and keep information about the version, um, checking the infrastructure. But what you find often is that the data is really the lurking problem, um, even when all of those other things were fine. Since 2019, our team um, at Y Labs has spoke to over 150 data science teams in mid-size and large enterprises. Uh, that have deployed at least one model to production successfully. Um, and we really want to understand their pain points. So one of the questions that they were asked um, is what was a recent failure that the team dealt with their machine learning models? Um, and every single team had a failure story. And what we're seeing here in this list that I'm showing, um, believe it or not, is just a tiny sample of kind of the many problems and stories that have been collected. Uh, software engineers in the audi audience may be noticing, um, even if you're not a machine learning person, they may be noticing on the left side things that are pretty common to um, general software development um, and continuous integration uh, or lack thereof. So um, you may be nodding at least to those. Um, but one thing that's really interesting are the things in the middle column and in the on the right column. Um, and what you see um, when you look closely, is that all of these issues are related to the data itself, like the value of the data, the distribution of the data, not just the, you know, whether or not data showed up, but what were the values? Did they get flipped? Did they get changed? Um, and that is something that it makes machine learning ops very different from DevOps, because DevOps tools normally are about testing, validating, logging, monitoring, um, certain issues related to service of your of your system, uh, things like uptime, latency, 
volume even, um, but not the things that we need to think about when we have data. The things that we need to think about when we have data, um, in addition to these things, um, are, you know, what is the what is the distribution of the data? How much of the data were they all kind of the same value? Where did they show different values than we're used to seeing? Um, and so these were some typical questions if um, you were in a position like I was while at Amazon trying to um, debug or root cause any issues you found on your model. Uh, so some questions might be, what's the distribution for a feature, uh, a feature being in, like a, a column input to my model? What, uh, what was the distribution of it last week and how do I compare that to now? Should I be worried about data drift? Has there been any change in the, the data that we're seeing as input or as output to the model? Um, is the quality of my data degrading? And then what data providers are supplying bad data? So if I'm seeing a bunch of you know, negative ones or not seeing data at all, how can I um, trace that back to who might be causing that? So, Given that there are so many data problems um, and that it's such a unique kind of space of problems, different from some other DevOps things, let's talk about improving just the data side of things for today's talk. So the questions are, how do you debug data? How do you test it? How do you monitor it? How do you document it? Every engineer who's been um, working with a machine learning application um, has to kind of improvise their own way of getting at at least some of these values. Um, and it's probably an ad hoc process even now. What it might look like, uh, what I did when I was at Amazon is something like pulling data down from storage, which, you know, maybe writing some complex ETL queries or other ways of getting to the production data from um, of recent run, and then processing that data. Maybe that's in a Jupyter notebook, drawing visualizations, doing a lot of like slicing and, and re-slicing of the data to see if I can uh, see anything that would stand out. And this work is incredibly tedious and um, rarely systematic enough as a process to find issues quickly. So it kind of depends on you, you know, having a hunch on what might have been the issue here and you know what things may have changed in your data for you to find something realistically in this process because there's so many possibilities. Okay, um, and then combine that with the fact that we have better and better systems that deliver more and more data. Um, and so you may be processing terabytes of data in minutes. Um, and so, if we look at kind of multiple steps in the machine learning stack, um, so here calling them processing raw data, generating features, training the model, serving the model, each of these kind of have their own data operations um, and, and involve a lot of calculation. So you may be transforming the data in certain ways. Um, and when you have such a kind of complex and high volume stack, uh, what you find is that each step of this stack um, may have the potential to introduce one or more data bugs, um, or it could just be completely derailed by a data bug upstream. Um, so machine learning models in particular are very sensitive to these sorts of data changes and issues. Um, machine learning models in particular, right, are looking for specific correlations. Um, if you extrapolate kind of outside of the training distribution that you were used to seeing, you're, you're gonna get really wonky answers in a lot of cases. So we need to be careful of things like missing data, duplicate data, bad quality data, data drifts, um, and so many more things. So this is uh, the solution that we came up with at Y Labs. We spent a lot of time thinking about these issues all of the people um, there had experience with working with machine learning models and running into the same issues I've been describing so far. Um, and one thing that we kind of drew on is a practice from standard software development, and that's logging. So when you log normal data, um, or not normal data, when you, when you normally log within software, um, we normally keep this somewhere um, on disk and you're able to use that to go back 
and facilitate root causing in a lot of cases to figure out what went wrong with your system. And we want this for data. We want to be able to um, monitor our data pipelines and machine learning systems with data specific logging. Okay, and so that's why we created an open source Ylogs. Um, Ylogs is purpose built for machine learning um, and data, and it's open sourced by our team at Ylabs. Um, it's lightweight, portable, configurable, and mergeable, and we'll talk about the benefit of that. Um, data logs for both batch and streaming data workloads. And uh, I'll share a link a little bit later so you can go check it out for yourself, but it's on GitHub so you can Google it as well. Ylogs is already making the lives of AI practitioners all over the world much easier. Um, it's available in Python, Java, and Scala under an Apache 2.0 license. So let's talk a bit about how it works um, and where it can go. So Logging, um, logging is, like I said, really lightweight with Y logs. Um, and so you can place it in many places in your pipeline. Um, so you can, um, it, it can also be integrated into kind of Spark pipelines, Python, Java, many popular machine learning frameworks. And you can capture data during the raw data ingestion step, during feature transformations and data transformations. Uh, during model training or after training, um, and then also during model serving and inference. And by systematically capturing and storing these log files, uh, you can create a record of data quality and the data distributions that you see along the entire pipeline. And this is really important. Um, so by comparing these log files uh, from multiple places in the pipeline, you can start to build data unit tests uh, data quality monitoring, uh, you can start to monitor performance um, and debug with these logs. All right, so let's see some example code and uh, get concrete here. So um, this is how Y logs would work in your Python environment. We uh, purposely made it very simple to get started with, um, although deeply configurable um, if you choose to do so. But this is how we can get started. Uh, you import Y logs, um, and in this case that I'm showing here, you, um, I'm using pandas to download a data set, um, and you can log that entire data frame that we that we pulled in uh, with one line. There's lots of other ways to log, so um, you can see right under the kind of red highlighted log data frame. There's other options for logging um, data that gets passed in as a dictionary. And we also have options for logging unstructured data like images um, and doing some transformations on those to be able to log them. So in addition to the, the very simple log process, uh, which produces a, a number of different types of files um, based off of your choices, um, but most popularly a binary file uh, that has a protobuf schema behind it um, that you can interact with and merge and do lots of things. So those are created and, and put on disk, um, but you can also do other things when you're exploring these profiles. Uh, so we made some nice tools to be able to visualize these logs. I um, mean, it's very helpful, especially because, as I mentioned, there's this kind of paradigm shift between thinking about machine learning in a static data set situation and thinking about machine learning across time. Um, and so those visualizations are really helpful. Um, and Kind of exploring multiple profiles um, is where you really get some of the value. All right, so another one is integrations. This is just one example integration uh, for MLflow. Uh, so MLflow, if you aren't familiar, um, is a very popular tool kind of in the machine learning community uh, that people often use for experimentation. I um, mean, so instituting Y logs in your experimentation pipeline is really great because now after you train a model, you can capture the distribution of data that you get from that training and compare the actual data against each other. Not just metadata, not just the hyperparameters, not just the evaluation metrics, but the actual distributions of data. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about like what's happening underneath um, and why Ylogs is so special and fits such a great role for monitoring and lots of other downstream uh, functions. 
So Y logs not only captures key statistics per feature, counts, discrete counts, summary statistics, but it does so by providing um, error bounds, um, and so error bars when you're drawing estimates, um, as well as an empirical density function. So you can see there, there's an um, empirical CDF at the bottom uh, for more accurate and detailed logging of your data and its distribution. The default configuration kind of infers the schema, so the data types, um, and calculates metrics with zero additional configuration needed. I mean, this is really important because we've had people use Y logs with thousands of features um, and no one wants to go and configure those by hand. Um, so it's really nice to be able to infer those uh, as we do and get it running right out of the box. All right, so one reason that the logs are so great and that you can fit it so many places is because of how um, small they are. They, they're really lightweight um, and this makes them really cost effective. If you were capturing um, the raw data and trying to store that somewhere, it gets really, really expensive, especially for production systems. Um, but our, our solution is very lightweight, both in storage size um, and in memory and in time. It, it works for streaming data, it works for batch data, it's great. The other thing I'll add here is that they're also mergeable. So this allows the flexibility to have a distributed deployment um, and just take the logs and merge them together uh, to, to get these same aggregate statistics and, and different results. So now let's talk about a couple of other things you might be considering um, and kind of why I think data logging is the right approach in the long term for ML ops. So one thing you might consider um, is something I uh, hinted at, and this is just using kind of standard software logging tools um, to do your logging for machine learning. And uh, does this fit all of the needs that we have for machine learning? No. I mean, the reason for that, again, is because we don't just care about maybe the volume of data that we see. We really need to understand the values and the distributions of the data. Um, and these tools, the traditional um, logging tools, aren't really meant to kind of do this analysis that you have to do of the data to be able to kind of capture the right information. Um, and you can see that in some, in some comparisons here. When you think about DevOps tools and what things you're often logging, you're logging things like the host name, uh, the, the application, the load, the uptime, uh, response time, CPU, memory, those sorts of things. And these things are important to understand how your service is running. Uh, but you also care about um, lots of data related things and that you only get with data logging. Uh, so that looks like, what is the distribution of the data? What, uh, what's the cardinality? How many different values, how many unique values? What are the um, missing values? What are the data types? What are the top items? All of these things are incredibly important for understanding your data. All right, good data logs should capture metadata, counts, statistics, distributions, as we mentioned. Um, it should be able to stratify samples. So if you have different classes, uh, you'll want to capture those in either equal proportion or certain proportions um, in a way that you're just really not able to do unless you have something purpose built for data. Key properties of a data log, uh, like I mentioned, lightweight, portable, Mergeable is really nice for distributed systems, configurable, um, and close to the code as logs tend to be. All right, second one, why not collect and store databases of kind of the full raw data without aggregating? And the answers are really scale and data transfer. So um, you may, like, as a data scientist, you may have experimentation pipelines and things like that, that um, have data sets that fit on your machine. Um, and so you, you could easily use a number of tools um, to just store the full data set, even if it's multiple copies. But when you move up to kind of very large scale um, enterprise systems or systems that just run often, your pipeline is constantly flowing and you're constantly producing data. Um, and in some cases, 
companies don't even store a record of what data was processed. There's just so much data there. Um, and so in that case, really a lot of data, uh, more data than you would imagine is ephemeral. It just gets processed and goes away. No one saves it. Uh, there's, there's not really any processes there for that. But if you're tasked with answering a question about the model or data, how it behaved earlier, you'll have to reproduce the whole data flow. And that is only if uh, you're able to kind of get back to a version that looks like uh, what last week may have looked like. I mean, it's expensive, it's, it's time consuming, it's really difficult. So um, the alternative um, for us now with Y logs, you're able to very easily and quickly store this uh, storage snapshots of this data, um, either for batch or for streaming. All right. Um, and another benefit here um, is to capture more accurate insights than sampling. So one thing that happens often if you're going to go the raw data approach and you're, you have a large enterprise system is that you'll just elect to sample, let's say, 1% of the data that's coming through. Uh, well, that works in some ways. One problem with that uh, that, we, that we talk about in a blog post here is that sampling is not as accurate as profiling the data. Because if you only have 1% of the data, you really struggle to capture dynamics of the tail of the distribution. All right, uh, so this is kind of in summary here, uh, Y logs can do a ton of things. You can instrument it um, many places in your data pipeline and uh, store this telemetry at different places that's very lightweight. Um, and this is with our open source Y logs library. If you want more features uh, than the open source library, we have a SaaS platform. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll upload the logs that you produce to the platform, which means we never see your raw data. This is all aggregate at this point. Um, and with that, now our platform can start to monitor and identify anomalies and also allow you to notify stakeholders and um, better converge on issues and better root cause issues that you have in your data. So with that, I will thank you um, and Hope that you help join us um, in building the standard for data logging. It, again, it's it's Y logs, it's open source. Everyone's welcome to join and and uh, please give stars and give feedback on on the tool if you've used it. Uh, we also have a swag survey, so if you if you would like a, a mystery box of swag, even I don't know what it is, um, you can click that third link. Well, um, type in that third link and um, fill out a quick form and get some swag from Y Labs. And I'm happy to chat with anyone about any of the stuff that we talked about or any of my research, anything at all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bernice. Uh, that was great talk. Um, Artie, the one audience, second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sure. grab a charger. Sure, no worries. All right, go ahead. Yeah, and audience, uh, you can type in your questions uh, in the chat. Okay, we have a question from Raphael, awesome talk. Could you comment on other data logging alternatives out there and how do they differ from Y logs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we haven't found any data specific, like purpose built for data logging tools. Um, I think we're really coming up with that category. Uh, I think the alternative that we're really comparing against would be people using kind of standard software logging tools um, and logging kind of some handmade statistics or just information about the data. Um, I could be wrong. There could be other data logging tools out there, but we haven't come across any in, in the last couple of years. Okay. Uh, this other question from Amar. If someone was working on a project and wanted to introduce Y Labs, do you have any tips or cautions for things to watch for? Yeah, um, so we've had a number of people, many um, many companies um, and folks have used Y Logs. Um, I don't think there's a ton of things to be too concerned with. Um, this, so this is running on your machine. Um, and it's very lightweight, so very quick, very little latency added to uh, kind of your process. Uh, the main thing really is thinking about how you want to set it up and kind of 
what information you want to aggregate at. Because it's aggregate statistics, um, you'll want to think kind of ahead of time, how would you want to slice the data? Are there any important features that you would want to see by category and things like that, um, and making sure that you set those up ahead of time. You can always set them up later and go forward in the future with those new settings, but it's really helpful to think kind of critically about what you want from the very beginning so you have as much data uh, kind of in the right format as possible. Question from Karun. Uh, how were you able to ensure your data log size or footprint was minimal? Yes. Uh, so I think this is the power of the data sketching um, algorithms in community. So data sketches um, is something that comes out of the databases world, um, and it's really meant for kind of very quickly querying a database um, and using kind of estimations and approximations to um, get a result from a, a, a database. So there's been a whole research community that thinks just about these specific things. How can I collect this information as efficiently as possible using as little memory as possible um, and often streaming and mergeable. So streaming meaning like you see one data point at a time and you never revisit it. Mergeable meaning um, if I can add two kind of logs together, you get an accurate result and that includes the error bars. So uh, thankfully that community works really deeply on these things and uh, we've been learning and um, hoping to contribute soon, but um, have, have been building off of kind of the strength of that work. Thanks. Uh, Nikhil has a question. In data monitoring, end users are often in observability teams. Are you seeing any such disciplines within ML ops? Yeah, that's a great question. So kind of a team that's specific to um, observability. I've certainly seen um, ML ops platform teams. So there will be other teams, uh, other kind of machine learning engineering teams that productionize the model, maybe a model that a data scientist or research scientist has created. Um, and then there's like one team specifically that is kind of focused on making sure that all of the metrics are collected and making sure that uh, these are running smoothly. So I would imagine that, that that sort of team is kind of the first iteration of an observability focused group where they're just focused on like making sure that everything is up and uh, kind of watching the infrastructure um, over time. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tarun has a question. How is uh, Ylog SaaS different from using a solution like Datadog? Yeah, great question. Uh, so I think the main difference is really taking advantage of all of the statistical information that we keep in wide logs. So um, if you're using something like Datadog or things that are built kind of for application service uh, metrics, you can certainly get metrics. Um, and I think in a way, in ways they look kind of similar, you know, in that they're both dashboards uh, that, that have agents that bring data. Um, but the real answer is that like, it, it's really complicated to reason about statistical data um, especially things related to machine learning. So in, y, in the Y Labs platform, we have evaluation metrics that are very specific to machine learning. Uh, we have things that are just a little more statistics oriented and specialized and purpose built for kind of this use case. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I was thinking as well, like we do have Kibana logs, uh, but that's like a general purpose logging right. mechanism. So with Y logs, um, you're suggesting it's more feature data specific and you can get more out of your feature data uh, as compared to a general purpose logs. But we may have to like have general purpose log and Y logs based on what we need. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I haven't done a ton of um, kind of looking into the folks that use Y logs, whether or not they are still maintaining those. Um, I'll say that, right, we don't have features that are kind of things like uptime and, you know, a number of metrics that you normally have from general purpose monitoring, but uh, we work on data. So 
We certainly have seen examples of people taking those metrics and importing them in as if they were data as part of a data set um, or uh, creating custom metrics with them. Uh, so that is certainly possible, but right, we're, we're more tailored to the machine learning side. So I'm sure there's some kind of things that were not really optimized for from the general purpose monitoring tools. Right, right, okay. Uh, Nasron has a question. There's a data quality checking tool called Great Expectations. Uh, how does this compare to? Yeah, uh, great tool? question. Uh, yes, so uh, I know Great Expectations well. Um, I would say that Great Expectations um, isn't really meant for long-term monitoring. It's kind of uh, you for one data set that you are passing in, and normally it has to be a full data set. I don't, I don't think it works in streaming, but I, I'm not quite sure in that. Um, you have a number of expectations that you've written uh, that it will check. So things related to kind of distribution or you know values being over a certain uh, value threshold or under a th certain threshold. Um, those sorts of things are possible in Ylogs and we actually have uh, them if you look into the Ylogs project called constraints. Um, and we're kind of working up our parity with the number of features. Great Expectations certainly has more kind of possibilities right now. Um, but the things that Great Expectations is missing is really monitoring, like anything that has to do with real time, um, or sorry, I guess I'll say time series analysis of the results. Like Great Expectations kind of treats those as individual results. Um, and we think about Okay, what was the results yesterday? How does it compare to today? We build a model across those days uh, to forecast kind of what it will be tomorrow um, and that sort of stuff. You don't get it all with great expectations. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to check, is there like alerting uh, mechanism in there or it is like for us to design and, you know, do our own alerting? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so there is monitoring and alerting. Um, and so after when we find an anomaly, um, we can produce an alert that goes to either your email or Slack or pager duty, uh, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Mark has a question. Can Ylogs be applied to Apache Kafka event-driven cloud environments for dynamic and fast moving data? Yes, absolutely. Um, surprised I didn't mention it specifically here. Yeah, uh, so we have a number of customers who uh, use our um, use our tool on their Kafka streams. It's a really great kind of um, solution for streaming because data sketches are all about streaming algorithms. So yes, we absolutely have folks using Kafka um, with Ylogs. Great. Another question from Tarun. Have you seen use cases or examples where people have built CI tools using Ylogs? Yeah, that's a great ex uh, question. So we have built an example um, with GitHub Actions, and it is on our um, in our Y Labs GitHub organization. There is a special. Uh, there's a a, re a repo for GitHub Actions. Uh, so that is one example of that. I'm not familiar with other people who have done that, but that's uh, just probably just a little outside of my realm as a data scientist. So there may well be many examples of other customers and, and users who have done the same. Thank you. I had a question regarding uh, logging some private information, right? Like uh, in healthcare, it's uh, important for the PHI, you know, so yes. um, in your experience, is there anything uh, like customers have? Yeah, um, so, I mean, HIPAA compliance is like its own kind of uh, field. So I, you know, I can't speak maybe directly to um, that, the particulars of HIPAA compliance, but I will say that we have had um, customers who have very private data kind of in that realm um, that have been using our tool. Um, and the, the sole reason that they're able to use it is because we capture these aggregate statistics and we do not at any point bring in or, or even see 
um, their individual data points. So uh, that has been a real benefit to lots of folks who have uh, pri privacy kind of sensitivities. Um, and yes, we so absolutely uh, feel free to chat with us and we can talk about the particulars of your case. Right. And in some sense, the logging of like the transformed feature data, right? Mm -hmm. That's almost seeming like a feature store. Uh, but I don't know if uh, anyone has used Vylogs in that sense or it's just not used in that way. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think um, I think you know the the concept and kind of use of feature store is still evolving. It's a new kind of concept that people are putting in in different places. Um, I think we certainly kind of serve a number of functions, as you've mentioned, just like that. Um, but there certainly are differences, right? So we are aggregate statistics, um, and often I think I tend to think of a feature store as something that um, you'll want to pull from to feed into your model. And because we're aggregate, you won't be able to feed back into. It's like solely on the out, the outside. Or if you're not feeding into a model, um, we have users who aren't necessarily doing machine learning, but they do have data. And so that in that way, it is a little more like a feature store because they're not um, taking it out to put it into a model for individual data points. They're just storing that information um, over time and so that they can version and things. Yeah, these are great questions. Yeah, and obviously you can distinguish between um, like model versioning and everything as well while logging, right? It depends yes. like how you tag your data. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you called it, we have a tag feature, just a kind of a key okay. value pair and you can pass in, you know, your version number, your, you know, you, the URL to your git commit if you want or any other things. And if someone has to try Vylogs and do like a small POC, is it quick to run and, you know, see the usage? Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that uh, you can just pip install and um, pass in data. Mm -hmm. And like I showed on a slide, it, um, it can fit in a couple of lines of code. Mm -hmm. Another question from Nasron. Uh, there's probably a backing store for the intermediate state for the statistical collection. What is it? Hmm. Okay. So I'm going to try to interpret this question. I, uh, Nasron, feel free to write in if I've gotten this wrong. Um, your question is kind of: Is there some intermediate store uh, of the data that you're doing the statistical collection uh, with? And the answer to that is no, um, and that's because these algorithms are like purpose built to be online streaming algorithms. So it, you know, there's some variables that you hold in memory uh, that might hold kind of some some value that gets incremented, gets um, yeah, incremented over and over again, and um, in a way that you can calculate statistics on when you're done. Um, but there's no kind of storage of the data anywhere, um, even as an intermediate state. You see it once and then it goes away. Did that answer your question or were you getting at something else? I can think maybe one more question, then we can call yep. it a day. That seems good. So does anyone have the final question? You mentioned it is uh, in Java, Python, and Scala. Yes. Um, so the entire like ML end-to-end -end pipeline may have different components, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then we'll have to utilize uh, the respective, uh, so we may have a Java service as orchestrator and then that talks to, um, you know, a serving layer in Python. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to deploy like Y logs of Java there and then Python here. Well, you would, Pick one, I guess. Uh, you wouldn't have to do both necessarily, unless you wanted, unless you wanted like to be in between both sides. Like so, mm. um, if you had a Java layer kind of talking to Python, you could either do it at the very end of the Java or the very beginning of the Python. Mm. Um, I should also mention that um, we've had customers use uh, like get a container for um, mm. Ylogs. Uh, so just have a container uh, that you could 
write it into uh, using an API. Um, and that kind of services all of the people who aren't using any of those three languages. Right. Yeah, that's helpful. All right. Okay. Well, this okay. was great. Um, feel yeah. free again. My email is up here. Um, I'm at Bernice at lots of places, so Twitter and um, all of the other places. Uh, but feel free to email me um, and or reach out to me wherever, LinkedIn. Um, and I'm happy to chat more about this. Um, and, and do go to the Ylogs GitHub repository and check it out. Um, it would be really awesome. Thank sure. you. Thanks, Ms. Bernice, for the talk. And uh, thanks all the attendees as well. Um, you can visit the partner booths if you've not done already. Um, thank you so much. All Have right. a nice evening. Bye.